We're going to read the whole chapter. It will come on the screen behind me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. If you have a Bible app and you want to choose to follow directly along. Psalm 139 verse 1. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. Are you good? He knows everything about you. You can't fake it with him. That's what that means in the Mark Evans translation. You can't hide anything from him. He knows the deepest thoughts. He knows your secret thoughts. He knows what you did yesterday and he knows what you're going to do tonight and he already knows what you're going to do tomorrow. There's nothing in your future that is going to take God by surprise. When we get surprised, it's, a, it's an understatement of saying that we are not God. That's why we humans get surprised. <gasps> I didn't know that was going to happen. <gasps> oh, I wasn't expecting that. But the thing about God, He's eternal and He's never surprised. He knows everything about you. Young people, He already knows who you're going to marry. Go figure that one out. He already knows where you're going to go to school. He's already in your tomorrow. You say, how is that so? How could that be possible? Because our God that we serve is eternal, meaning He's not bound by this time frame that we live in, meaning God is not bound by sun up, sun down, 24 hours. God is above our time frame. That's why He says, I'm both the beginning and both the end. That's how God, because He's not part of time, He's above time and separate from time, God sees the beginning from the end. In other words, God already knows right now when the end is coming. It might be in 10 minutes, we don't know, we're human, but God knows because He sees it all. And so everything He's doing, He's working toward the end. In other words, nothing ever takes God off of His game because He's always working toward an end result. Now here's what's weird. He's so powerfully God, He's already in your future before you ever get to your future. This is why trusting Him should be so easy. Now if you only see God from a temporal mindset, a human wisdom, then it's hard to trust Him because you and God both are rather nervous about your future. You're biting your nails and He's biting His nails. He doesn't know what He's going to do with you and you have no clue what He's going to do with you either. So you cannot dumb God down to only human wisdom. He's above our wisdom and so therefore if He's above our wisdom and He's eternal, meaning He's not bound by my time frame and He sees it all, that means He's already in Mark Evans next week. In other words, my God is already in Wednesday knowing what's going to happen to my life on Wednesday and therefore when He says, trust me, it's easy because He's already there. Do you, do you follow that? Well, if you don't believe that about God, it's okay. I'm not forcing that belief on you, but that's why He's God. He's eternal. Let's read on. You know when I sit down or stand up. You would think it would be so big He wouldn't care about that stuff. What does it matter when you sit down or stand up? You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. Some of you might want to let him help you out on that one. <laughs> you go before me. I love this. This is weird. I don't know how it's possible except that he's God. You go before me and you follow me. That's strange. That shows you he's eternal. Like God's not just behind you going, where are you going? Where are you going? He's also out in front of me going, come on, come on, come on. He's both. He's both behind me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He's behind me always, but he's also in front of me always. That means even when I blow it as a human and turn around and run, I'm going to run right into him. I'm just going to bump right into him. He's going, where are you going? Well, I blew it. I messed up. I said something I shouldn't. I did something dumb. And he's already behind me going, well, I already knew you were going to do that. So chill out. Turn back around. I'm out in front of you. Just keep following me. Right? It's not like you, you freaked him out when you messed up. He already knew it. Such knowledge, I love this. Listen to this, verse 5. You go before and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Now this just to let you understand, God's never trying to hurt you. Even when you feel like he's pulling you to do something you don't want to do, he's trying to pull you to it to bless you, not harm you. 
If anybody ever teaches you that your father's trying to harm you, they're reading a wrong Bible. He's not trying to harm you, he's trying to help you. All right, listen to what he says. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. That, you get that? You can go clubbing, he's there. I mean, he might wait in a parking lot on you, but he's there. Right? I'm not saying he's going to go in the club and watch the pole dancing, but he'll be close. He might be hanging out in the bathroom waiting on you. But he's there. Don't ever think you can get away from him. He's always there. And I know we're religious. We think he's in this room right now because it's church. But when you walk out, whatever restaurant you go to, he's there. Whatever car you're in, he's there. Young people, wherever you are and you think you're private and you think you're getting away with it, he's there. He's right there with you. It's one of the reasons I turned out halfway decent as a kid because my mom instilled that fear in me. Where are you going? I'm lying. Oh, just hanging out with my friends. Okay, got a good lie going. She believes me. Thank God she's dumb. And then she would put the Pentecostal mojo on me. I just want you to know, wherever you go, God goes with you. Golly. And you know, okay, I can get away with that. And I'd be, okay, well, you know, God's a good God. He'll let me get away with some stuff because I'm a teenager, right? And he kind of understands teens. And then she would even go deeper. And I just want you to know as I'm walking out the door, wherever you are, he talks to me and he'll tell me. Oh, no, no. That's cheating. That's cheating. You can't parent that way. That's cheating. We're supposed to be able to get away with stuff. Well, not if you're raised by a mama who talks with God. You don't get away with much at all. Why? Because God knows everything. And he's trying to bless you, not harm you. He's always in front of you. Listen. Verse 6. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell on the farthest oceans... Even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness I can't hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Do you understand when you blow it and you feel like you've just totally ruined it? You've made the dumbest decision you could ever make. And you run home and you're in your bedroom pouting and crying. I've just blown it. You cut the lights out and you have a pity party moment of depression. Do you know the glory of God knows right where you are? And do you know He says it's okay? He says in your darkness I can bring you light. That's the goodness of our God. He's a lot bigger than we've made Him out to be. We've dumbed him down to Google and Wikipedia and we've taken him out of what he really says he is. He is a brilliant heavenly father. You make me, verse 13, all, you, you made me all delicate. That's why I wore pink. Inner parts of my body, you knit me together in my mother's womb, meaning you're not a mistake. I don't care how you got here. I don't care if your mother got pregnant by mistake. I don't care if you were given up for adoption. You're a foster kid. Whatever it is, your parents left you, your mama left you, your daddy abandoned you. According to God, you're not a mistake. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. God knew you were coming. God knew you were on the way. You didn't, even though mama may have abandoned you, God already knew you were going to be here. And you say, well, why would he let me be born to a woman that would abandon me or a father that would hurt me? Because he wants to lavish you with the greatness of his love. He loves you that much. He goes on to say this. Thank you, verse 14, for making me so wonderfully complex. If you've never known what that means, marry a woman. <laughs> Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Listen now carefully. You saw me before I was born. Listen. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out for me before a single day had passed. Listen to me carefully. God already knew you would be here. He already knew I'd be talking to you. He already knew I would read this scripture. And he knew all of that before any of us were ever born. 
And he, if you got here, it wasn't just because somebody invited you and you came and you oblig- obligatorily showed up to bless mom or a friend or... Even though you may have come out of obligation or duty or religion or invitation or however you came, it didn't surprise God because before you ever were even born, God already saw today. He already knew what would happen in 2018. And though you were struggling about what to wear, He already knew what you would put on. That's how brilliant our Father is. We think that we're just down here left to fate. We think we're just down here and God has nothing to do with us. But accordingly to what we read, every day of my life has been recorded in a book. He knows me from my beginning and to my end. My life really kind of took a turn when I, you know, I royally blew it. I'll spare you the details. But I was throwing a pity party after I royally blew my life. I was in one of those moments where God probably can't ever use me again. It's just not worth it. And this is what the Lord spoke to me out of this verse. I really felt like God prompted me in my heart. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but in my heart I felt like He was speaking to me. And He said, Mark, I called you even before you were born. And I already knew you would blow it. And I called you anyway. What? I knew you would blow it. And I still called you knowing you would blow it. Because I knew you would come back to me and let me to continue to bless you. Because that's how much I love you, Mark. So even though you may have royally blown it and you're wondering, can my life ever be what it is? Maybe you're here tonight and you think you're on plan B. Some of you may feel like you're on C or D. That you've made a decision that's put you on a path that's the wrong way. You may have married the wrong person and had a tragic end to that. Maybe you lost a loved one and it really sunk your battleship and you've been struggling with the depression for a long time and you feel like your life is on a plan B, plan C. It's really not your bucket list. It's not what you really thought life would be and you're anxious about it and kind of depressed and nervous about it. Let me tell you something. According to what I read here, there is no plan B for your life. Your entire life has always been plan A. It does not shock God that you blew it. It does not shock God that things happened to you. All he simply says is, in through the midst of it, can you continue to trust me? Can you continue to let me lead you and be in front of you and put my hand of blessing on you and know your beginning from your end? And as weird as this is, come on now, as weird as this is, he already knows when you're going to die. He already knows when you'll stand in His presence one day. He already knows the end of your life. He knows everything about you. And He simply says, if you'll listen to me, and if you'll trust me, and you'll come under the shadow of my wing, and you'll put your hope in me, and you'll put your trust in me, I will give you a long, prosperous, and blessed life. But if you turn your own way and do your own thing, I've even told you in my scriptures that a fool can die before his time. I mean, in other words, there is a time appointed, but if you're foolish, you won't even get to the very time that was already appointed to you. Listen to what he goes on to say. Verse 17, How precious are your thoughts about me, God. They cannot be numbered. In other words, God's not ticked off at you. He's not mad at you. He's not upset with you. He's not trying to teach you a lesson. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. Oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. He's going through a hard time. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. Oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with a total hatred for your enemies are my enemies. You, you can tell the hurt in his life. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And I want you to underline this in your Bible and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I want to talk to you tonight about everlasting life. In the South, where we grow up in church, it's a different ball game maybe than if you've never heard the story. But the story of everlasting life goes something like this. Totally unbiblical, but it feels good and spiritual. Mark dies, and I go up, and I see a bright light. 
And I follow that light to some pearly gates. And at the pearly gates, there's a man named Peter. And I'm standing in line with everybody like, hey, what are we doing? Oh, we're in line. We're going to get in up that city up there. Well, what is that? That's heaven. Well, what are we standing in line for? Well, when you get up there, he's going to ask for your name. And then you give him your name. And if he sees your name, you get to get in. Okay, that's cool. I'm in. And I step a little closer and I get a little closer and finally I get up to the pearly gates and there's a kind of a bearded long dude with a long white flowing robe and a long beard. That's kind of what I picture in my mind. And St. Peter opens this big family book up. Name. Yeah, Mark. Okay, let me see here. Okay, Mark, you're going to have to help me. i got a lot of Marks. <laughs> okay. Charles Mark? Okay, Charles. Charles Mark. Okay, I've got a lot of those. How about a last name? Evans? Okay, Charles Mark Evans. That narrows that down. Ooh, boy, there's been a lot of y'all. <laughs> Charles Mark Evans. Uh, last four years social? Okay. Uh, okay, no, I'm not seeing it. What? Your mother, your mother, your mother was June and your father was Gene? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got them. Here they are. Gene, June, your brother Gary. Oh, yeah, here's Gary. I got him too. No, I don't see him. Charles Mark. What? Chuck? Okay, let's try Chuck. Okay. <laughs> Chuck. Uh, Big E. Okay, they called you Big E. Let's try that one and see. Uh, well, Big E? Uh, uh, what? You went to church. Okay. Oh, great, great. Went to church. I still don't see you. I'm looking. I'm sorry. I got a, I got a social security close to you. What was your Facebook? <laughs> okay, hang on. I saw you shared a, an account with your wife. Oh, she's up here too. I still don't see your name. I'm sorry. Well, so what are we going to do? Well, listen, there's a long line of people here. There's going to come somebody here to grab you, and you're going to go down the hall, take a left, and then take the elevator. <laughs> Pardon? No, I know you're as high as you can go. You're going to go down. Just press the down button. Right? <laughs> now, now, that is sort of the religious Southern Bible Belt thinking. That when you die, you're going to be standing in a line of dead people waiting to get into a place called heaven that has streets of gold and pearly gates and a guy named Peter is going to be there waiting on you. He's going to be checking for names. Um, as, as fun as it is, it's just not even biblical. Peter is not checking your name off. But turn to the book of Revelation because I do want to show you what is going to happen to enlighten you tonight on what you could expect, chapter 20 of Revelation. Verse 11, and I'm going to take this a lot deeper in the weeks to come, but I want to shallow it up and just give it to you to think about tonight. Because in the weeks to come, I'm going to talk about what does eternal life look like for us. And I saw a great white throne, verse 11, of Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. That's God, not Peter. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, plural, books. The books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. That psalm, everything you've ever done has been recorded. There is a literal book that has every word you've ever said, every thought, every secret, everything you've ever done. There is a book in heaven that has everything you've done. Even if you didn't get caught, even if nobody knows, and even if it's still a secret in your mind. Every thought, every word, every action of your life has been recorded. And those books are held by God. And it goes on to say this, The sea, verse 13, gave up its dead, and the death and grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. And then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone, say anyone, 
anyone whose name was not found recorded the second book into the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is different from hell. Hell is not the lake of fire. Hell is where the dead people go. The lake of fire is where everyone who's never known God will spend eternity. Two totally separate places, but I know in our thinking today, hell is just hell. Totally different. Hell is the dead people where they go to wait, and then once judgment comes, they come up out of hell. Death and hell are thrown in the lake of fire, and then we're judged. And here's the judgment, two of them. Number one, I'm going to check your life against books. I'm going to look at everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, and then I'm going to go through the book of life to see if your name's there. If your name is there, you're good. If your name's not there, eh, you're out, lake of fire. And Now watch this. This is important. And it's an eternal thing. Meaning if your name's not there, there is no second chance. There's nothing else you can do. There is no tomorrow. This is the end. This is the moment of decision. Decision's already been made. You're standing before God. There won't be any excuse acceptable. There won't be any way to talk your way out of it. Why? Because whatever you try to talk your way out of, your whole entire life, thoughts, words, actions, and everything are already recorded. So if you say, but, 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 he'll just turn to that page and go, well, right here, here's what really happened. Here's what was really going on. Now here's what I want you to understand. Number one, if you live a good life and do everything perfect, you can go to heaven. It's a true statement in the Bible. Turn to Romans chapter 2. I want you to turn, listen, don't, don't leave me yet. Because God has to judge you by those books first. And if you do good, and you prove that you're good, you get eternal life. You don't even have to believe in Jesus. If you're good, and you do good things, and you can prove to Him that you've done good things, you'll get eternal life even without Christ. Listen to Romans chapter 2, if you will. Verse 5. But because you're stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of God's anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Listen now, this is important. He will judge everyone according to what they've done. Aren't you thankful? He's going to judge you off of what you've done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good. I'll slowly read it again. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But He will pour out His anger and wrath on those who live only for themselves and refuse to obey the truth instead of wickedness. Meaning that if you live not for yourself, you live unselfish, you give everything away, you're a good person and everything you do is right and good and just and fair, you will stand before God one day with or without Jesus and God will say, let's look at the books, yep, you're good, you did it all, you did it perfectly, great, come on in, live forever. There's only a slight problem. Just a slight one. Romans 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, no one is seeking God. All have turned away and become useless. No one does good, not even a single one of you. You see, God leveled the playing field. If you can do good, come on in, baby. But let me go ahead and tell you, none of you can do it. And if you don't believe it, just ask the person next to you, are you 100% good? Because everybody in this room at one point in your life has proven you are not all good. Even if you have a smidgen of bad, you're not 100% good. So if you've ever had a bad thought, if you've ever kept a secret, if you've ever told a lie, if you've ever stolen anything, already bad, you're going to hell. There is no hope. 
But if you can be perfectly good, you'll get in. The only issue is, there's not a human in this room that says, I know somebody who was perfectly good. Because we all have failed. We, we don't even live up to our own moral codes. We set a moral code and a month later break it. I swear I'm never eating cookies again. Swear it. Done. Sugar, out. Never. Never, never. 32 pounds later, whoo, I did it. Glory, I'm in the pants I've never worn. And then you go out and just gorge on cookies. Like you reward yourself, the very thing you said you would never do. See, the reality in this room is all of us humans know that we will do the very things we swear we will never do. Nobody in this room is good. So God has canceled that one. If you can do perfectly good, I'll let you in, but let's go ahead and own it. Not a human around is ever good enough. Nobody in the room. So here's what I love about God. He leveled the playing field for all of us and said, Good, now that you all know nobody in the room is perfectly good enough to get in here, let's really talk about what matters. And listen to what he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Let's start in verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. I love this, no matter who you are. For everyone has sinned. We all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead, remember he's eternal, and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair. Now here's why he's fair. He gives everybody in the room the opportunity to prove how good you are. That's how he's fair. He gives you the human will and the freedom of your will to prove to him how good you really are. And by making you not a robot, but a human with a free will, your free will is allowed to show him that you're perfectly good and every intention you mean well. But if you're honest with yourself, we all know none of us are good. So God comes in front of that plan and says, good, now that you've acknowledged that you're not good, now that you've acknowledged your failures, now that you've realized that no matter how hard you try, you can never perfectly be good enough, let's talk about what I'm really after. I need you to be right with me, Mark. I need your life to be right with my life. Now here's how we're going to do it. You blow it. You've lied to me. You've told me you would. You've broken rules. You've, you've, you've gone back on your word to me. It's okay. I already knew you would do it. Now I've made another way. I need you to believe in, in me and the Son, Jesus. He's your righteousness, Mark. He's the one that makes you right. So for those of us that may like to argue, well, why is Jesus the only way? Because he's the only one that was perfectly good. And so his perfect goodness gave him the right to be the way to get to God. Because he was sinless, he never sinned. And so because he never sinned and he was perfectly righteous, having never sinned, Jesus was the only human that ever did it perfectly good. So why are we mad that God says just believe on him? Why are we so angry? Arr, there's got to be more ways than just that Jewish carpenter Jesus. Arr, arr, there's more ways to God. Worship the trees. Arr. Like, why are you so angry? Why do you like multiple choice? He's already told you the answer, gave you the answer, told you what to pick, and just says, so pick it. And then in our wisdom, I don't want to pick that one. Why not this way? Why not Buddha? Why not a rock? Why not a tree? Why can't I just worship Mother Earth? Oh, you stupid humans. My God, haven't y'all got college degrees? I'm the teacher, the creator. I'm telling you where you failed, and then I'm giving you the answer to the test. How much more do you need? You failed the first test. Good, I'm giving you the answer to the second one. 
So if you blow that one, it ain't my fault. If you end up in the lake of fire, you skied there yourself. You took your own canoe down that river. I've already told you how to avoid the lake of fire. Get right with me. I didn't make it a secret. I told you what it was. I told you what to do. I told you how to do it. And I'm fair. Now not only is he fair, he's incredibly fair. Because he says, let's level the playing field. You're all guilty. And now I'm going to tell you the answer to the test. Believe on me. Why, why are we humans so mad at that? The God that created the planet told you how to live forever. He told you what to do. But maybe it's because we get stubborn and we, we think there's other ways and we think he'll overlook and we think he can trust my good intentions and we think, like Olivia said, I can keep bringing him the junk of my sacrifice, never really my real life. I never really lay me down. I just lay all my stuff down. I never really give him my whole self. I just give him part of myself because we all know that the, really the best way to live is a little bit of me and a little bit of God just to make things go well. Now listen to what he said in Romans as we read on. Verse 26, For he was a looking ahead and including them in this present time, and God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and when he makes sinners right in his sight, and here it is, when they believe in Jesus. It's that simple. Eternal life is as simple as as just believing in Jesus. Do you see, our human wisdom has made it hard. Well, don't you have to cut your hair, quit smoking, get rid of pot, not tattoos, don't wear makeup, be a Baptist, be a Methodist. Do we dunk? Do we sprinkle? Do we speak in tongues? Do we not? Do we sing? Do we have drums? No drums, organ, no organ. Can women do it? Can women wear makeup? Can women preach? Should they preach? Shouldn't women be quiet? How about men, uh, elders, deacons? We've, we have muddied the plan. In our brilliant wisdom, we are told how to get eternal life. Put your faith in Christ Jesus and you will have eternal life. There are no rules. There are no bargains with me. There are no please forgive me, I'm sorry. I already knew you would do it anyway. I already knew your failures. I already knew where you would mess up. I'm just simply telling you, come to me with your mouth and just proclaim you believe that Jesus is your righteousness and the only way to be right with me and that you believe that his punishment was your punishment and his life is your life and we'll call it even. And you will live forever. And do you know what the beauty of that is? The moment you choose to believe, the moment that you say unto God, I believe, that book of life, your name is in the book of life. And now there is no second guessing. Will I make it? Will I be there? For the moment you say, Jesus is Lord of my life, you are making the proclamation that you're now right with God. Now watch His beauty of His grace. And He already knew you would fail. And he already knew your lies. And he already knew the worst of the worst. And he still says to you, come to me and believe. Listen to what he says. I love, I love how it goes. Verse 27. Can we boast then that we have not done anything to be accepted by God? Not because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith. Not by obeying the law. Not by living all the rules. Romans chapter 10 in conclusion. How do you believe in Jesus? Do you clean yourself up? Do you make bargains with him? Hey God, if you will, I will. He already knows you rarely will because we'll fail him again and again and again. What do you do to believe in Jesus? What do you do to make sure that your eternal life is certain? You don't have to walk out the door wondering, have I blown it? Will he forgive me? Listen to Romans chapter 10. Verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, openly, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in Him will never be disgraced. Jew or Gentile, the same in in each respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That includes you. But Mark, how can I call on those to be saved unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they've not heard about Him? You just heard. And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them, I just did? And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent, I have been? That's why the Scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring you that good news. But, verse 16, not everyone welcomes the good news. And yet, God already knows who will and who won't. God already knows who will say yes and who will say no. But He equals the playing field again in this room because I don't know your heart, I don't know your secrets, I don't know your failures, I don't know your sins. But from the foundation of earth, God knew everything about you. And he levels the playing field tonight saying everybody in the room, Mark included, has failed me. Everybody in the room is not good enough. But I'm going to level the playing field and tell you you all can be right with me. You all can have eternal life with me. And you all don't have to worry about being judged by me if you but believe in Jesus Christ. And confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And if you confess that publicly and, and believe that, you will be saved. But how can I be saved unless I've heard? But how can I hear unless someone preaches? And how can someone preach unless they've been sent? In other words, God knew tonight that you needed Jesus, so He sent you somebody to tell you about Jesus so you could hear the news about Jesus so He could open up and give you an opportunity to say yes. Bow your head and close your eyes.